What's going on guys, welcome to our video and today I'm finally giving you guys a video that you have been waiting for that is a Chelsea Lone Army roundup video. We're going to be talking through every single Chelsea Lone That's right, there's a lot of them. And we're going to be going through how they've performed so far this season. I'm going to try and get these videos out every single month so that you guys keep up to date with all the latest news on the Chelsea Lone and you know exactly how they're performing. And then obviously as we go into next season, that means you'll be up to date exactly on where they could fit into the squad and if they could make an impact at Chelsea. So just before we get into this video, I'm really going to ask you guys because this this video it's really long there's so many Chelsea Lonies it's taken so much research to make this video and to be sitting here at 3 a.m when I have to be up at 7 tomorrow it really has taken a lot of me to make this video for you guys and get it out today so if you don't mind just make sure to like the video hit the bell notification when you subscribe to get me close to 2,000 subscribers and comment something down below because commenting really helps push the video out and if you want to feel extra nice watch this video in its entirety until the very end and those four things will absolutely make my day seriously you don't understand how much effort this video has taken but anyway, I'm going to stop begging or waffling right now and we're going to get into it. So we're going to start with Nathan Baxter. Nathan Baxter is a player that has progressed up the leagues, been in a lot of low moves at Chelsea, which is often what goalkeepers have to do. They have to work their way up to gain trust. And he returned to Hull City this season after spending the season there on loan. This time he has an option to buy. And that's how I'm structuring this video. The first couple of players are going to be the ones with an option to buy as they're less likely to have a, a future at Chelsea. And Nathan Baxter obviously rejoined Hull City. He spent the first portion of the season out the side because he suffered a dislocated finger in pre-season, which halted his progress. But he's back, been back in the side for the last four games and looks good he hasn't had a clean sheet in any of those four games but that's more about Hull City of a side who have been really really bad and in that period they've actually sacked their manager and currently under a caretaker manager while they look for a permanent manager to take over so yeah Nathan Baxter has been good we're going to be talking about Hull City much later in the video also because they have three Chelsea Lonies in total in that team Harvey Vale, Xavier Simons and Nathan Baxter so trust me you'll know a lot about Hull by the end of this video but yeah Nathan Baxter is now their starting goalkeeper he's looked good no clean sheets because Hull overall have just been a very poor side but he himself has been good next up we've got the infamous Timuri Bakayoko and we're definitely keeping this one sure and sweet because he had played 11 minutes since the 17th of January 11 whole minutes and if he plays one more appearance in the league for AC Milan by the way he's not even included in their Champions League squad but if he plays one more minute for AC Milan in the league they'll have to activate his option to buy for around 12 or 13 million pounds so you probably definitely won't be seeing this guy for the rest of the season I do feel bad for him to be honest because he's just gonna have to sit on the bench or not even make scores for the rest of the season but that's the situation so Bayakioko it has been an absolute blunder next up we've got Malang Saar who joined AS Monaco this summer for an obligation to buy of 13 million pounds I believe that will be activated on an appearance basis and he has already made six appearances for AS Monaco this season but he's been benched in the last two games so please Malang can you get back on the pitch please because I want that 13 million for you because to be honest that is an absolute steal and I don't really want to see you back at Chelsea nothing against you as a person but I don't really think you're Chelsea quality so I get back on the pitch and hopefully Monaco activate that 13 million pound option to buy next up we've got the infamous the incredible the joyous Romelu Lukaku I mean he embodies everything about our club absolutely love Chelsea doesn't he completing the journey as he told us a year ago that he was coming back to his boyhood club what a load of rubbish gone to Inter Milan made three appearances before getting injured got a goal and assist in his first two games and that's enough that I want to say about him the only thing I'm going to say is those people putting tweets out there saying that he could work under Graham Potter we could call him back yeah in theory but what he said about our club in interviews and everything like that I don't care if he's scoring 20 goals a season he's not coming back to Chelsea I don't want to see that guy in a Chelsea shirt there's rumours that his loan move to Inter Milan actually involves a second year they'll be activated I believe on an appearance basis or something like that so hopefully that is the case and we can just get rid of this guy because he's an absolute parasite right now we're into some of the more normal low needs no options to buy on these ones we're going to start from the lower leagues and work our way up and we're going to start with Ethan Wadey who joined Woking FC and there's actually nothing to say on Ethan because he's been sat on the bench for every single game for Woking this season picked up a small injury and has been left as the substitute goalkeeper so hopefully he gets back in the side soon but nothing to report on him next up we've got Sam McClelland who joined AFC Barrow in League 2 he's a centre back from Northern Ireland a very like old school centre back he's decent on the ball but not really exceptional at all just a very hard tall centre back very physically imposing he's been very good for Barrow actually gone got got into their side pretty early on got a golden assist from centre back and is a pretty regular mainstay in their side so it looks like a good low move next up we've got quite an exciting player and that is Joe Haig he joined Derby under 21s on a six month loan move this summer which is very obscure obviously six month loan move usually see a year one and Derby under 21s they usually go on loan to a professional side but he went to the academy side and his plan was to try and bridge the gap between the 21s and the first team during his time there which he said in an interview when he joined they didn't really 
really feel that option was open to him at Chelsea. So far, it's gone really, really well for Joe. He's played three games for the under-21s on his debut. He's got a really, really nice solo goal. And then I believe in his third game, he scored again. But definitely two goals in three games. It was a beautiful, beautiful lob over the goalkeeper after being played at the top again. But Joe Hager's had a really good low move so far. And he's even earned himself already after only three games for Derby under-21s. To gain a place in Derby's first team squad about a week ago in a League Cup game and hopefully one day during this low move, during the six months spell, he'll be able to get on the pitch for Derby's first team. But it's so positive that after only three games, he scored two goals from midfield for Derby under 21s and he's already made the bench for the first team. Next up, we've got a player that you guys will be really excited about, and that's Gabriel Slonina. Obviously, we signed him this summer at the 18-year-old goalkeeper, already the mainstay in the MLS, in a professional side with Chicago Fire, chased by Real Madrid, but Chelsea managed to win it, probably after a phone call from Petr Cech, because we do know he had a phone call with Slonina, and I bet that was a tipping point. It's Petr Cech. When Petr Cech comes calling, it's a different call, but... Ever since joining, it's been a bit of an up and down time for Slanina. Not really him, it's more about the way Chicago Fire plays because they're not really a very good side. He's had two clean sheets in nine games since the loan started actually from Chelsea. Overall, he's had 32 games for Chicago Fire, kept 12 clean sheets, which is a very good record considering the level of Chicago Fire and made 82 saves. He had one ridiculous game while on loan in the last uh, nine games where he made nine saves and by the clean sheet in a single game. It was absolutely brilliant in that game. Overall, he's a brilliant shot stopper from what I've seen. I've watched a couple full games of him and obviously watched some highlights. It's quite hard to catch the games because they are on about 2 a.m. but I have caught a couple. Action shot stopper. One of his main things that I really like when I watch him, he's a brilliant, brilliant commander. He's not scared to shout to people, lead them, even though he's only 18 years old, even though he's a very young player in their side. He acts like a leader. He's well, well above his age. He's very mature and his mindset is brilliant. Honestly, I do think this guy could have a huge future at Chelsea. Whether that's coming back in January and immediately having an impact, I can almost 100% tell you that won't be the case, even though some people think he's going to come in and replace Mendy or Kepa immediately. I really doubt that's going to happen, but he really is a promising player. He's also good with his feet, as you'd imagine from a young goalkeeper, as that is the modern game, but you can definitely improve with that too, and he definitely will as he grows older, as he gets more experience. It's something that will definitely come along. But one thing, there's been breaking news about an hour before I decided to film this video. Apparently, Gabriel Stalina will be returning to Chelsea for a short training stint, a 10 to 15 day training stint at Cobham. He's going to be leaving Chicago Fire uh, to come back to Cobham. Apparently, he will go back to America but it's actually up to Chelsea if he goes back to America or not they can decide whether he goes back to America or not as the ball is in their court obviously when a lone player is on loan Chelsea can decide whether they recall him or not obviously it's inconvenient since Chicago fires in America and Chelsea in England but Chelsea still hold that power so it's gonna be very interesting to see Gabriel Slina at Cobham for a 10 to 15 day training stint whether he sticks around after that I'm not sure I doubt he will because I feel that'd be pretty unprofessional from Chelsea to just steal Chicago fires number one goalkeeper after agreeing to keep him there and until the end of the MLS season, which ends in January. But nonetheless, it'll be cool to see Slanina at Cobham and hopefully we get some training picks while he's here. But yeah, very promising goalkeeper. He's had a good low move and hopefully he comes back and probably goes on another low move in January. Next up, we've got another goalkeeper in Jamie coming. He is, of course, at loan at MK Dons, where he spent six months of last season. And he's had a positive loan spell when you look at just him. But the story is, like last season, MK Dons have been very, very poor. Now, they are in the relegation zone, 10 points from 11 games. That is absolutely horrific form. This is a complete 360 from last season, where MK Dons were near uh, getting automatic promotion. They were a very few points of automatic promotion, coming third place, which is the place below automatic promotion. And then they disappointed in the playoffs only going in the semi-finals and didn't even make the finals. This season, he rejoined them, probably expecting them to be back around the top, pushing for promotion. Obviously, he would have preferred them to go on a championship low move to keep progressing up. For some reason, there clearly wasn't the right club interested. So he went back to MK Dons, but it's been a complete 360, as I said, in the relegation zone. Terrible, terrible performances. Jamie Cumming has definitely been their player of the season so far. All their fans are saying it. Whenever I watch them, he's the most impressive player. And you'd imagine that. Usually the goalkeeper is the best player because they're constantly facing shots and shots and shots. And Jamie is an excellent, excellent shot stopper. Uh, and he's already won their player of the month award. I believe it for August, but it doesn't matter. He definitely won player of the month for one of the months of the season. So the thing is with this season, right? When you contrast to last season, Jamie Cumming was on loan at Gillingham last season. Now, Gillingham were in League One at the time, but they were at the bottom of League One. And in January, Jamie left Gillingham 
and went to MK Dons. Now, the reason for this was because Gillingham were playing so badly that he needed a better club because it wasn't useful for him to just be shot-stopping every single game, be at the bottom of League One, and then not be able to garner a good loan move the next year. So he went to MK Dons where there was a more ball-playing style and maybe he could get a better loan move the next year. But that better loan move didn't come about and now he's at MK Dons. And if you look at the trend, MK Dons are playing exactly like Gillingham played last year. They're at the bottom of League One and I expect that Jamie, again, will be recalled by Chelsea in January and will again be put on a different loan move to try and go to a team that will use him to his strengths more, improve his ball playing and hopefully garner a better loan move next year. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it might just be a waste of a season for Jamie. When you go on a loan move, especially for goalkeepers, you want to see progression and if Jamie ends up being recalled in January and then goes to a team higher in League One, it will literally just be a complete repeat of last season. So it really would have been good to see him make that jump into the Championship but in the end, at the end of the day that didn't happen. So hopefully the best case scenario is MK Don suddenly pick up their form and they go back near the top of League One and Jamie doesn't need to be recalled and try and find a new club in January which is always a hectic time but that might be the case and it might just be a repeat of last season but overall Jamie himself has had a good season. Sticking with MK Dons now, which we've already said they're having a very poor season, we're going to go with Henry Lawrence. As I said, also on loan at MK Dons with Jamie, but not having as good of a time. It's been very, very up and down. He faces very heavy competition, being a right wing back. He plays his competition from the ex-Arsenal, but now Brentford player Daniel Oyagok. He looks to be coming into his zone around in August, Henry Lawrence did. Uh, it was a bit of a shaky start, didn't have the best performances at the beginning of August, but started to look more solid at the beginning of September and end of August, even bagged an assist, but since then, he's gone back the up and down form he gets thrown in and out of the side which doesn't help with building consistency and he also gets thrown around in position so he plays left wing back one game and right wing back another game so overall it's not been a great low move for Henry Lawrence so far hopefully he manages to build some sort of consistency with his form and with his minutes and then hopefully that translates into a better season for Henry next up we've got another goalkeeper the six foot nine that's right 206 centimeter Finnish beast Lucas Bergstrom, who is on loan at Peterborough United. He started off absolutely incredibly. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Usually goalkeepers start off at very low leagues because it's hard to gain trust as a goalkeeper to go into a side. But somehow, his agent must be insane. He got had a League One loan move in his first ever loan. And I thought this was a huge step up, but immediately went in and was incredible. I'm going to be including a highlight reel as I talk, again, if I can get past copyright, uh, of his highlight reel. And this is only from mid of August. So he'd only played a handful of games for this highlight reel. It's the only highlight reel I could find. So it just shows how impressive he is to have this many highlights in just the mid of August. And now we're in October, so you can only imagine how much it's added on. Now, he has slightly slowed down since these highlights were out or since around mid-September, but he still played very well. Again, him slowing down is more to do with Peterborough's form on the whole. But Peterborough are still doing very well on the whole. They've just slightly slowed down maybe in the past month or month and a half. They are near the top of League One. They're one point off playoffs, and hopefully that continues. And maybe he can get into playoffs and even get promoted into the championship, which would be brilliant because then he could just stay with Peterborough for the next season and immediately have a championship club secured. But if not, hopefully he can garner a championship loan next season. But just so far, if we're looking at this season just alone, he has had a very, very good first loan move. Next up, we've got Brian Fiabema, who was recalled from his loan move at Rosenborg, a Norwegian club, uh, because of lack of game time. We did have an option to buy on that loan move, but it clearly wasn't going to be enacted with his lack of game time. So he joined Forest Green Rovers, and this, he started very positively. He got an assist in his second game off the bench, and then from then started three three games in a row, getting a goal and an assist in his third start. And it looked really positive and slightly surprising after a poor move at Rosenborg. But then since then he had two relatively average, maybe poor performances and then went out the side and also has picked up a minor injury, which I don't think he'll be out for for long, but hopefully he can kick on after that because he was looking very positive before. The next player I've got is Jaden Wareham. He's on loan at Leighton Orient right now in League Two. He's made only two appearances so far. He joined quite late on, on deadline day, but in his first game, on his first start, on his day, he scored two goals and not only two goals but two goals in the first 10 minutes imagine that is such a good debut he's scoring two goals in the first 10 minutes he's such a pure striker honestly if you talk about strikers you talk about completely pure strikers just goals 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 that is Jaden Wareham to a T he said it when he joined Leighton Orient that he brings goals and he wasn't trying to be cocky he was just stating a fact and he really really does do that so yeah he's made two appearances the problem with for him is that Leighton Orient are doing really really well they're second place in League 2 right now so it is really hard for him to get game time but if he keeps banging in the goals just like he did on his debut he will start getting their games and hopefully become a regular star next player we've got is Dujon Sterling. Now his story to join Stoke has been well documented. I talked about it in my Chelsea Lone Army season previous. I'm not going to repeat myself too much, but 
basically just a very long story short he was very close to completing a low move to QPR but an injury in a preseason game versus Boreham would stop that from happening and that injury lapped over it initially looked like just a very simple knock he got the injury on July 15th but ended up kept going on kept going on and he only ever made his debut for Stoke on the 2nd of October but he immediately got thrown into the starting 11 no bench appearances and since then he's played three games in a row two of them are left wing back and one of them are right back and he has been absolutely brilliant and who's surprised from Dujon Mustard or Dijon I said how some of them call him out all the fans call him that because he is absolutely brilliant the good thing about this loan move was I was told before he chose his loan club that what he wanted to get out of this loan move was a more attacking loan at Blackpool last season his defensive numbers were off the charts because Blackpool were quite a defensive side but if you watched Dujan on the academy you saw he had a really good attacking game to him and that's what he wanted to bring back this season and that's clear with the way he was deployed as a left wing back in their first two games and even when he played a right back in the last game he was trying to get forward and create chances he wants to get assists this season and that's exactly what he's doing he was absolutely brilliant in their last game a lot of people were calling him the man of the match for that game when he played right back and obviously as I said left wing back in the other two games so it's looking like a really really positive low move for Dujon. Next up we've got Baba Raman he rejoined Reading after spending the season there on loan last season he's played three games overall but hasn't played since the 17th of September he injured his hamstring while on international duty and is going to be out for around a month. Reading are actually doing quite well this season they're only two points off top hopefully Reading continues to do well Baba Raman continues to do well and maybe they buy him at the end of the season because I think there's a chance he you won't be making it at Chelsea. Next up, we've got a really, really interesting player, and that is Ian Martin, who obviously went on loan to Burnley. He's had a really, really up and down time. He started off incredibly. One of the best starts for a loan move I've seen, scored a sort of goal in his first game versus Huddersfield from left back. And then in his fourth game, he managed to bag an assist and was playing very well under Vincent Company. But then, as we all know, in that game, I'm sure you all saw the red card because it went pretty viral. He got a ridiculous red card, got tackled, and reacted very poorly. It was very funny, I'm going to be honest, but very poorly, and absolutely walloped the guy, gave him huge huge whiplash with a shove and got a red card was suspended for three games and this really halted his progress he came back against West Brom after he said the suspension and had a really really poor game this led to him being left out of the side for a while played a couple games looked really poor but then he came back in his most recent game against Coventry his old side who were booing him from the sidelines which I thought was very unnecessary but he was brilliant once again a lot of people were saying he could have been a man of the match contender for this game I'll show his stats on the screen now that I tweeted out at the time but he had a really good performance and it was important for him to have a good performance because as I said he had been quite poor ever since that red card versus West Brom but it seems like he's back and the thing about this low move is the main thing is he's playing in a back four under Vincent Company. anyone who's watched him knows he's a very attacking player and defensively his son as well lets him down he does always have have high tackles in his stats because he likes to put himself about but his defensive awareness is quite poor and it often is lacking and in a back four that gets very much exposed which is what a lot of Burnley fans were getting annoyed with Martin in his first four games it was his attacking side that was coming out but as time started to loom on they started to see the defensive frailties come about so that is really good for Martin for me even though he had some poor games it's a really important that low moves provide learning curves for players and he's going to learn how to adjust to a back four improve his defensive awareness across the season and how to adjust his positioning in a back four I think this will be a really important season for him to progress as a footballer not just be an attacking player but have to be defensively minded so it seems like he's starting to already get the hang of that and hopefully that improves as the season goes on next up we've got another mixed bag and that is Tino Andrin who returned to Huddersfield Town on loan after spending six months on loan there last season but struggled with injuries after picking up a meniscus injury at Lokomotiv Moscow but he went back there it's been a really really up and down time not only with him but with the club they've gone through three managers they had Carlos Colbran last season who was a brilliant manager got them to the playoff final but then he left during the summer because the club weren't aligned with his vision they weren't really backing him with money and that was getting annoyed with him and it was fair enough because he deserved the respect with spending because he's a very good manager they then decided to go for their assistant manager at the time and that was Danny Schofield who was absolutely awful he left them now they're in they've only got 11 points after 12 games and their second last place and now they bought in another manager they've sacked Danny Schofield now they have someone called Mark Fotheringham now they did win their last game 2-0 against Hull City so Hopefully that is a sign of progression in the future, but overall Huddersfield have been dire. Now Tino Andrin himself, as usual, we've seen lots of flashes of brilliance. His dribbles, he's such a good dribbler, has a lot of flair about him, scored two goals, a brace against West Brom, two beautiful goals, but hopefully it's about building that consistency. We always see these flashes of brilliance from Tino, but it's about seeing that on a consistent basis and not just game to game, but over the period of 90 minutes. I think his fitness does need to improve, but I'm not bashing him at all because he's a very self-aware player. After his brace against West Brom, he stayed very humble and he said in the post-match interview that yes, I'm happy I scored two goals, but my off-the-ball work needs to improve. And if he's 
aware of that, then there's not much else for me to say. He'll improve on that. Currently, he's going through a bit of an illness. He played in their game on the 17th of September, just before the international break, but had to be hooked at half time due to an illness, and he's still out with the illness. So I really do hope that it's okay, and it's nothing that's actually going to impact his health. And hopefully, he's back as soon as possible because he's got so much talent, and I really want to see it applied on a consistent basis. Let me go through Hull one more time for the culture because we need to talk about Harvey Vale. Now, Harvey Vale joined very late in the window, signed a four year contract extension at Chelsea, which was brilliant news because over the summer it looked very unlikely that was going to happen until big Todd Burley stepped in. And as we know, he's been brilliant with youth contracts this summer. But Harvey's only made one appearance for Hull on the 17th of September. He started a game in a 3 0 loss to Swansea. And I'm not going to lie, he really wasn't good in that game. He played right wing, was semi at fault for a goal for not tracking his man, and he got in behind him and scored. And just overall, he really didn't have much of an impact but that was under the old manager as I said when I talked about Nathan Max they have changed their manager they had shot that out of Aladze the Georgian guy and now they have a caretaker manager and they're looking to bring in a permanent manager so hopefully he'll get his chance again he definitely will get his chance again he's a very talented player it's understandable it's your first game in professional football it's always going to be an adjustment period and he got thrown in at the deep end didn't manage to get an appearance off the bench was under a bit of a plonker of the manager to be honest but he had a really uh, impressive uh, international break he captained England in the 20s in their second game they played two games in the cost the Kalida Super Cup and they won that trophy obviously Harvey captaining them he's clearly seen as a big leader considering he captain England under 19 to the Euros in the summer and then he captain England under 20 so that's very good to see him taking up a leadership role and hopefully have a really bright future in the game but right now he is out with an injury which should keep him out for another one and a half to two weeks which he picked up over the international break so hopefully he's back as soon as possible right we're into our last three low knees now and we're going into a record breaking low knee but not in a good way and I'll tell you why in a second but it's Ethan Ampadu who's gone alone to Spezia and I'm not going to lie it's not been a good start at all he had a good game against Sampdoria in his second game he's played four games overall but we have to talk about the other games and in his first game he went up against Napoli directly against Kovicak Varaskelia that's how you pronounce it in Georgian by the way I am half Georgian so that is how you pronounce it for anyone wondering or in English a lot of people like to say Kvaradona an absolute baller of a left winger he was directly up against him as Ethan was playing right centre back and he had a bit of a difficult game it wasn't that bad but he just never looked quite comfortable and at one point got Namek to buy him. but overall it was a fine first game but then he didn't really improve and had the absolute game of his nightmares against Lazio in his third game he set a serial record for uh, the minute that you can give away a penalty he gave it away in under a minute I believe maybe even 20 seconds in I don't quite remember but it was a new serial record for the earliest penalty ever given in a match luckily Lazio missed the penalty but it didn't really help because he was also at fault for another goal where he got turned by his man and then couldn't track the run and the guy finished it in the box after a cutback it was honestly an awful game from Ampadu just to be completely honest and then he played his last game against Monza, I believe, where they lost 2-0 again. I didn't manage to watch that game, so I'm not sure how he played. I don't think he was uh, actively bad. I don't think he was actively good. But my main problem with this low move, obviously Ethan hasn't been playing that well, but it's his misprofiling. I don't know why Spezia, and even Chelsea, because apparently Chelsea asked Spezia to play him as a centre-back. I don't know why Spezia are playing him as a right centre-back. Now, I've said many times on Spaces, on Twitter, that Ethan Ampadu's best position is as a defence midfielder. This is a fact. And he only watched him at Venezia last season, where he had a brilliant low move, could see he was most effective as a defence midfielder, always shutting down spaces, so good defensively, and also very good on the ball to express himself. Now, he's also very good at central centre-back. We saw that in pre-season, so I wouldn't really be complaining if we saw my central centre back because it allows him to open up his passing lanes he loves a vertical pass in behind and just connecting play and again using his defensive side but when you put him at right centre back or even at left centre back then that's when his defensive awareness in behind really has to kick in and that for me is the weakest part of his game he often doesn't know what's going on behind him that well as a defensive midfielder he does a right at it he scans well but when he's on the last line it doesn't work well and for me it's very frustrating to see a player use the right centre back when actively a million times you've seen him play in that position and he hasn't really performed for Venezia when he played at right centre back he always looked slightly more shaky for Wales I remember watching a specific game against Belgium about a couple months ago he played at right centre back looked really poor moved into defensive midfield later in the game and looked so so much better he is a defensive midfielder we need to stop misprofiling him because if you throw around a player I know he's versatile but if you keep throwing around a player into different positions it doesn't help with their progression it doesn't help them at all they need to be played in one position and if you want to mix positions do DM and central centre back do not play him at right centre back really 
Chelsea need to have a word of respect to him, tell him to stop playing him there because he never played well there and it's just going to continue. It's just going to be a waste of another year for Ethan Ampadu, who really should be in the Chelsea squad for me because our midfield is so weak we could use those numbers. But anyway, overall, it's not been a good start. Hopefully, he's starting to use in his best position aspects here because it will just be a waste of time if he keeps playing Rice in the back. Next player we're going to talk about is someone that if you look at Twitter, the people who don't actually know what they're talking about, they're going to say, how can you say this guy is going to be good enough for Chelsea if he can't even start for Brighton? Well, Levi Cole, the person we're talking about, I'm telling you, is good, is good enough for Chelsea. He's going to be good enough for Chelsea because I watched him at Huddersfield. I watched him for England. I watched him in Chelsea's academy. It's not coincidence that every Huddersfield fan tells you this guy's going to be England captain. I've watched him so many times and I'm telling you, this guy's going to have such a big future at Chelsea. He's going to be a legend status, in my opinion, if Chelsea actually integrate him correctly. But I don't have full confidence we will, to be honest. But if we don't, he's going to go to another club and prove to everyone why we should have. And I think it would be a KDB level of mistake if we did. I'm putting everything on the line for that. But but we're not talking about that today. We're going to be talking about his loan at Brian, which 100% has been underwhelming. But it's not really about Levi. People will say, oh, he can't even get into Brian's team. But it's not about Levi. It's about Brighton. How well they've performed, how much they've overperformed under Graham Potter. And even in the first two games under De Zerbi, they've looked very good. And it's the fact that they have a very settled back three. And that back three with two players who are usually quite injury prone in Adam Webster and Joel Veltman, who stayed completely fit throughout this period. And they're very settled. They're all three are experienced players. And obviously, if you have a winning formula you're not going to change it even Graham Potter when he was in charge of Brighton said how am I going to bring Levi Cobble and how am I going to change his back three if we're winning every single game there's no reason so just be patient with Levi his time will come someone will get injured maybe they go into drop a form and Levi will come in and I promise you he will cement his place well I don't promise you because the Premier League is a big step up I'm not going to be naive but I do think by the end of the season after a bit of time he will be cementing his place in that team a very very promising team don't underestimate Brian he has joined a brilliant brilliant club it's such a big step and it's brilliant that he's got a low move there just hopefully it translates into playing time but don't be mistaken he's still had a very good season in every single game he's played he's been very very good I'm going to go through it now now, he made his debut at Old Trafford and secured the clean sheet. He was very, on for a very, very low number of minutes. I'm not going to pretend to guess it up, but he also played a game for Brighton and on the 21s to build up fitness. Again, do remember, I forgot to add this caveat, that he didn't actually have a preseason at Brighton. He joined very late, had an injury-ridden preseason at Chelsea, so he wasn't very match fit, came into Brighton after their preseason, so he couldn't be involved in anything in preseason, which is usually when you build up the squad, build up playing styles and everything. He wasn't involved in any of that, and then had to build up his fitness. So in part of building up his fitness, he played one Brighton under 21s game, against Liverpool and even bagged an assist from centre-back which was good to see. He then started his first game for Brighton against Forest Green Rovers in the EFL Cup and it wasn't a televised game, there wasn't an official man of the match but judging from the journalists that were there that built up their match reports, no bias, they weren't Chelsea journalists, they were just Brighton journalists. They all said that Levi Cole was man of the match for the game, his ball playing ability, his dribbling through the lines was all on show and obviously they picked up the clean sheet in that game so it shows that even in that game, even though it was a smaller game, he got his first start and he's still impressed. Then he took that form into the international break because he got called up to the England under 21s, obviously the step below the senior level and he was brilliant for them. He got a clean sheet in the first game, looked really really good and then in the second game picked up the man of the match award and got a tackle that definitely saved them from conceding a goal. He was absolutely brilliant so hopefully Levi, obviously it's been a slightly slow start to his life move but as long as he starts picking up game time soon I'm sure he's going to impose himself and everyone's just relaxed because it's not like he's been playing bad there's mitigating circumstances Brighton have been overperforming they've got a really consistent back three experience is going to take time. The last one we're going to talk about is probably the one you've all been waiting to hear about and the player that's been most hyped before this loan because obviously he's been in the first team for quite a while and that's Callum Hudson-Odoi, the boy wonder that never really got going at Chelsea after his ACL injury, no Achilles injury, sorry, but he went on loan to Bayer Leverkusen and he got an assist in his first game within about five minutes of things coming on and everyone got gassed. Now since then he hasn't got a goal or an assist and people who don't watch the game have been, I don't know, screenshotting his sofa score stats and saying oh he's been terrible but even though you want to see goals and assists translate, because that's been probably his biggest problem at Chelsea, he hasn't been getting enough goals specifically, his assists have been good, but when he watches performances, he dictates games. He's been so, so good for Leverkusen. Now, I'm not going to say he's been 10 out of 10, but I think it's been a really positive start. Now, from this, you want to build, you want to start getting goals and assists and influencer games even more. But from what you've seen, playing mostly as an attacking midfielder or a left wing, which has been great to see because obviously at Chelsea, one of his big problems was not being played in his optimal position. And really, just about getting that consistent game time. And now, obviously, 
obviously Bayer Leverkusen have sacked their manager. They had Ciro Wane as their manager and they were doing really, really bad. I think it was their worst start to the league in 40 years, I think I saw a stat was, but now they've brought in Xabi Alonso, obviously a brilliant player and played under a multitude of great managers like Guardiola, Ancelotti and Mourinho. And I believe his dad was actually a manager too. So he really has the foundations to be a great manager. And that can be seen because in his first game in charge, Leverkusen already won 4-0 in their first game and Hudson Odoi was instrumental to their second goal. So to sum it up, really, great to see Chogek consistent game time. He's looked really good. He's really involved in games. He's getting involved in goals, but it's time for the goals and assists to flow. And I'm very happy to admit that. And hopefully that will come in soon. But overall, it's been a very positive start. So there you go, that is the end of the video. I hope it's not too long, but there are a lot of loanies to go through, so you know it is going to be a long video. But if you haven't yet, make sure to like the video, hit that bell notification so you never miss an upload. Comment down below because it helps the algorithm, and I will see you next time.